Hello ballers and a bro fist to you all. Welcome to Sweden and the wonderful setup I have. We are live as day one of the race to world first. Or I should say day one has just concluded for the big start of the final raid of Dragonflight. So I thought we'd do some uh, day by days of what's going on. Also to track my journey through this. It's always a mystery as what we're going to encounter over the course of this and adventure. All the ideas and all the presumptions and all the planning and plotting that goes into the race to world first can very easily get thrown out of the window depending on what blizzard has decided to do throughout the fight so i thought we'd track how we're feeling here in the camp it's a bit an interesting one i'm actually filming this in the morning of day two which i was up at 4 a.m uh, to get started with the eu boys nice and early did a cast with dratnos at 5 a.m but let's rewind coming into this race to world first Obviously, from the Echo Camp that I'm usually with, looking for a longer raid, looking to not be overgeared, looking for not the sort of two-day race that we had last time after the splits were done. Technically, it was like five, I think, but the actual Mythic progress was just two days uh, until Sarkareth did fall, and that's not what they want for a number of reasons. One, putting in the thousands of hours collectively the players put into the Race to World first, including our preparation, flying people across the world. You know, we have a lot of Americans here. Uh, to actually get to raid for two days is disappointing. It's upsetting. It's not what the guys are after at all. And also from like a financial standpoint, having an event that like feels lackluster at the end is just not good. The Race to World First, certainly for Echo, is like their big event of the year and they want it to do super well. So it's like always a little deflating when that comes out. And I know a number of the players felt like maybe if the raids were going to be like this and Blizzard was saying, we want shorter bosses, we want it to work that way, that maybe it was no longer for them. Like, genuinely, it, I had a lot of conversations after the Sarkarath raid of people, like, dejected. Like, I'm not sure if my heart's in this anymore if we're only going to get stuff like this. So, big thing with this one is not to have that, and it looks like that is going to be the case. Of course, I had not only Final Fantasy XIV's fan fest, but BlizzCon just before this, many of us uh, only got to be home, uh, our actual homes, for a couple of days before we then left uh, to come here to the event. Absolutely amazing. This is a massive venue. You've seen some clips. I actually did a big tour yesterday, uh, and Chris could put some little clips in of what I did there, uh, showing the whole place. It's an enormous venue, loads of room. Everybody's kind of chilling and having fun, and much more of a family vibe now with the Echo. I would say over the years, certainly since uh, Sepulchre, where we all ended up spending like three weeks together in a very close environment, uh, with a lot of tension, a lot of mixed emotions, tension, happiness, joy, sadness, elation, uh, Echo bringing on that world first, is there is a very family vibe here now. The Echo production team has not changed members at all. The roster doesn't change too much, and the casting team has been pretty rock solid. We've been sort of cycling in the seventh spot uh, for a while now, but the six that were at Sepulchre are still here to this day, so it's very much a meeting of the friends coming in, and the first day I got here, I was supposed to be like streaming day one. I arrived on Sunday after a ridiculous train journey. Um, and that, But when we got here, like they, they'd added two more players. Bello and Kush came into the environment uh, and they had to borrow a lot of my streaming stuff. Uh, so I had no PC, but it was fine. Like everybody was just being together uh, and welcoming each other. And obviously we have Nagura join us this time who I've done a little cast with and she was amazing. So, so happy that she's here. Uh, she's slotted in really, really well. And gets the vibe of it's much more relaxed, we feel anyway, than like the liquid broadcast, uh, which is, seems a little bit more produced, a little bit more professional. Over here, it's like we, tr uh, the production team trusts us to do what we want to do, and it's for the best of the show. Uh, so we, we kind of have a lot of uh, not free reign, but they still rein us in regularly. We could go way further with a lot of stuff, but they're still like, we kind of trust you guys as not only just content creators, but the people who've been around this environment for a while in order to do what you want to do. So in that regard, I got to open the show. That's my absolute best thing. Uh, we do it kind of as a team these days, although Dratnos uh, was late. Uh, intentionally, he pre-warned them. He's like, he had to do some stuff. He's got the morning shift. Dratnos is literally casting right next to me right now. Uh, so he was like, I'll, I'm going to be there a bit later because I'm trying to get as much sleep as possible. And it's just totally fine. Uh, absolutely no problem there. And so opening the show, I love that. I, like, the level of excitement that builds into me uh, while we do that. And of course, we had the big meme, which was uh, Echo raiding in North America. Uh, now, I found out about this at BlizzCon because uh, a lot of the Echo players were there. And Roger was there and he explained to me, he's like, yo, we're going to go for the world first Far uh, Farak normal. 
uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's good content. We're going to be in North America. Get people invested. Get people interested. And it's actually happening. We've prepared those characters. They're geared. We're going to be doing that. Uh, and secondly, we can start finding stuff out a day early because we don't get to do that because obviously it comes up in North America first. We do not have a global release yet. So we can actually start working on various things and we can have a Farak that we can mess around with uh, even off stream and just learn. You, you might be questions like, what can you learn from normal mode? Lots of things. You can be testing just exactly how the pools work, exactly how the ads work. What is the really efficient way? And you get that extra day to be doing stuff on the final boss. That might be stuff that pays off either in the heroic splits, which we'll be seeing in the next day or so, or when we actually get to mythic, stuff we found out that day earlier that we wouldn't have had access to otherwise. And especially when they're doing all the splits, the players are tied up, which means if they want to science and mess around, mess with weak auras, whatever it might be, you do need a group of players to be able to actually engage the boss and cycle it through its phases to test various things, which means the players not only have to do the splits all day, and then they're kind of burned out, but then you're asking them to go and bugger about with a boss off stream during what potentially, or at least as far as the audience is concerned, as the resting downtime, right? So that was kind of the approach they were taking there is one, we'll get to see the finale cutscene. Great for viewership, uh, great for engagement, which it was, although the cutscene, I don't know, man. Kind of cringe. <laughs> Kind of cringe. And coming off the announcement of the World Soul and the story being such a big focus going forward, the cutscene didn't really inspire. Let's put it that way. We had family uh, as it was going on. And a lot of... Uh, I've rewatched the stream of us watching it because there was, I don't know, like 70,000 people watching that. Uh, and we're all like, huh? <laughs> what happened? A lot of her emotes and question mark, question mark and family spam. Uh, but yeah... I'm kind of hoping there's a mythic variation of it that has happened in the past where the mythic is the canon ending uh, to the story. I know a lot of people like gets a bit pissy about that, but what they usually do is after mythic has been defeated, they can filter that down into normal and heroic where you get some sort of alternative canon true ending that's going to happen. As it is the last boss of the, the final raid of the expansion, typically there is some sort of myth mythic element that's mythic only. Uh, which is something to look forward to. We'll see if it's happening. I believe it should happen. Uh, and we will get to see something like that. But we did get to do that last night, which was really fun. We got to see Echo Blast through normal. We had uh, all, of, um, all of them on silly characters, which were geared uh, and able to clear through it and claim that world first. I know it's, a silly, it's not a meaningful world first by any means, but it was nice. It was a nice opener to the show. I thought it worked out really, really well. What I did like in particular was immediately after... Straight away, the caster team, which is obviously more my perspective. I will give you some of the player perspectives. Uh, immediately sat down and started going through things. Okay, how did that go? Um, eye contact was good. Like, I, 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 I take like a, a hosting role, which is not by any sort of appointment. I'm not asked to do that by any means, but uh, it, it's more like I'm, I think, I, I think out of this team, maybe Dratnos is more experienced than me. He probably is. Uh, but it's more a case of, making sure everybody gets a balanced input on what's happening. Especially when you've got someone like Jeeth. If you saw uh, the way the room was set out, is Jeeth was off to my right, which I wasn't looking at as I was on the right-hand side of the couch. Uh, so it's making sure that everybody gets a balanced input on what they're going in and trying to play to their strengths of what knowledge those casters are particularly good at uh, in order to make sure we get the absolute best out of that caster team and make the caster team look and be as good as it can be, right? There's no point in tossing random questions to people that they're like, I don't know. <laughs> That's not my area of expertise. Every caster brings a different area of expertise. Uh, so making sure that that is directed and stuff is kind of the role I take on that. And um, it went well, uh, from what I can tell. Really happy with it. And I got to do the room tour. Super happy with this. This is a combination of new tech uh, that we've, we've had access to now for... I think like three or four years, NDI tech is what it is. It's been out for a while, uh, but utilizing it really smoothly in a, a decent scale of production is always risky. It's the ability to walk around and use and trust in the Wi-Fi to actually carry a really clear video signal uh, on the move via a mobile phone. Like mobile phone cameras are so advanced now that you, for a stream purpose, you can't tell the bloody difference. You don't need like a dolly and a giant like Elgato or Blackmagic 4K camera or 8K camera to follow you around like a mobile phone is more than good with a handheld gimbal which was ali who you don't really see on camera but ali is a photographer and cameraman uh doing all that stuff uh, and again the freedom was there like um i got no prompting for that it was more a case of do a room tour go 
Uh, and that's what I love. That's what I absolutely love. It's like, just let me kind of do my thing. Uh, and if it's a problem, then we'll, you know, we'll fix it at a later date uh, if I screwed up. But uh, I found it really fun. I, I went to, uh, the idea was to talk to all the players, but I got a message uh, that um, even though it had been tested three times, which is always the case for production, because uh, I know some people, I'm bringing this up because some people are asking me, is like, okay, why did you stop at Scripe instead of going to like Mirez and Kush and Clicks who are all sat, sat on the other side of the room? Um, it's because I got a message saying, for whatever reason, even though we've tested this like three or four times, the mic is cutting out here. Who knows? Some new interference, something was happening. So pull it back uh, and we'll get interviews with those players later. There's no, no ditching of those players. Just the message like, the mic's cutting a little bit because it's a, a, a wireless mic. That I was carrying so i was like okay reverse course go back i was going to talk to all the players uh but it's one of those things that happens on the fly you just got to roll with it and hopefully keep the show running smooth as you're getting all these messages very hard actually i'm pretty good at it now is receiving a lot of messages while i'm talking and presenting so i'm not i have to focus on that but also like taking this information and then modify and adapt it as we go uh so that was super fun got to do that and then got to come back on the cast and then cast of course uh the normal raid clear what was a bit of a bummer though i said all that stuff at the beginning uh, is that Echo was hoping to uh, spend some time with Farak, right? And uh, mess around with it and stuff. But the, their actual, what you'll have noticed is as they got to Farak, one of the characters left the raid. That's the character that then has the save, that lockout, so that they can go back in and Farak is still alive because they weren't there for the Farak kill, right? So you can go back in, you still have Farak up, even though the rest of the raid is saved and can't get loot, but they can still pull the boss and mess around with it uh, rather than just go for the kill, which is what they did on stream. Um, and then we got the message, uh, thinking they may have even gone into heroic for some memes, uh, is that they're all going to bed. I was like, oh, that's really surprising. I thought they were going to do this. And it turned out their cards are bugged out. And when it went back in, Frack was dead. And they were like, well, I wasn't even in the raid when Frack died. But whatever it was, I don't. Th it's not that Blizzard did anything intentional to prevent that happening. I don't think that was the case. It was just a case of some sort of bug with the ID or whatever it was. So the guys were like... We can't even do what we kind of mainly aimed to do with doing this process. All right, we're going to bed. And everyone just got up and they were all like out of the building in the next 10 minutes. Like, we're out of here. Good. So we were like, okay, cool. That's the end of the show for the night. Uh, and then getting back into it this morning. But we do have that slight advantage and it's kind of coming into play now as we're in, in, in day two. I'll be casting again later on. Uh, is we're seeing that Heroic is much tougher because Liquid is currently doing it, right? This is the kind of the advantage you get on the non-global release is that little bit of information. It's not a great advantage. Uh, some people always overplay what the advantages are. They're minor, and some of them are, are, are good for Liquid. Some of them are good for Echo. Uh, and this is one that is good for Echo, is they can kind of see that Smolder on Heroic is, is tough, right? They're seeing Liquid's having a few wipes there. So it's like 20, 30 minutes. But that 20, 30 minutes is probably not something that's going to hurt Echo as much because they probably know, okay, we need to put more main raiders into these splits where obviously they play with viewers and um, main raiders to try and maximize the amount of loot. But it's those little advantages. And again, it's like 30 minutes or something, maybe 45 minutes that gets saved. But in a race that may end very quickly, as we saw with the Sarkrath raid, that stuff adds up quickly. It really adds up. So although, you know, you get that extra day at the back end on the liquid side before the reset, it's one of those things that, you, that kind of sort of balances itself. There's always pros and cons, right? It's a nuanced discussion which is very hard to have, especially if you're a super fan of either one of the guilds. Is No one likes that, but it is the, the way it's going to be. A global release would fix both those things. Although I have to say, it was really nice waiting for the NA servers to come up and dreading it because we have several casters here who've worked with Liquid before and had to deal with the NA servers. Uh, and they were like, yeah, okay, so always when the NA servers come up, it's an absolute nightmare. It's a clusterfuck. It's, it's the worst thing of all time. Excuse me. Uh, that's gonna be bad and it was perfectly smooth the guys were in there and playing and gaming like immediately so that was kind of fun to see with the eu presence over in na uh day two though it's uh normal mode splits i started the stream this morning with dratnos uh 5 a.m the guys have already been in for a couple of hours uh with normal mode splits which are going super well echo's running four splits side by side and all going pretty smooth and again they're running that internal competition amongst themselves as to whose splits get done faster and it's really important that they do that one not only to just keep motivation of the players is like okay we beat your team i beat your team but a lot of the characters aren't in one split team right so you might be in split run a of run one but you're in split run b of run two so if you have a group that is lagging behind or is 
way ahead because you've not balanced the splits properly, then that team's not got downtime because they're waiting for that player to swap to his alt to join the other team. And Echo has become exceptionalist, as has Liquid, with doing this as efficiently as humanly possible. And the way they do it is by balancing it and competing against each other. So we saw like all the teams finish within five minutes of each other. So four runs all finish within five minutes of each other. And the same is happening again with the later splits that's going on. So they need to keep that pace for the next couple of days uh, to make sure these splits are done as quickly as humanly possible. But now they know that they're definitely by smolder on in Heroic. Maybe we're going to have to mix and match some groups. So I'll get back to you tomorrow on what's happening with that and what the vibe in the place is with these splits. Last time they were so chill and so free because the raid wasn't very hard, right? It wasn't a super hard raid, and they were able to do multi-splits with viewers, and it was no problem. They had a little issue with a couple of Sakura heroics, but not too much. Blizzard, definitely, we got this huge item level gap this time, uh, and also we're dealing with uh, the raid just generally being harder, uh, which is also gear-related, right? Whether it's mechanically harder is hard to say, but it's uh, it's certainly in this early stage. But certainly gear-wise, they're, they're way less geared comparative to what the boss demands this time around. So whether that'll even itself out over the next few normal modes, hard to say for sure. But that is our day, my day one recap. I'll try and do one of these every day and see if the mood changes. Right now, I can tell you the players vibing, chilling, smiles. Cast the team is absolutely full of energy, looking forward to getting things going. Had a really strong start to the stream. Uh, and we haven't even gotten to like the silly stuff that's going to be coming over the next couple of days. I have no doubt at some point something will be going into my mouth, which is unwanted, but it will be happening. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.